Welcome everybody to part two of my chess.com puzzle rush survival run. This is Daniel and if you haven't seen part one which came out yesterday I'm going to link uh, the video in the description below where I solved the first 25 problems of um, chess.com's puzzle rush survival tool which essentially is a set of problems of increasing difficulty and you solve as many problems as you can with unlimited time until you get uh, three strikes, so until you get three problems incorrectly. So as I explained yesterday, it's an excellent tool to improve your tactics and to have some fun. And Puzzle Rush comes in several varieties. There is timed Puzzle Rush three and five minute versions of it. Um, there's Puzzle Battle where you play other people. What I'm doing here is Puzzle Rush survival mode where I have unlimited time to solve all the problems. And I do this so that I can walk uh, you through the process uh, of solving each of the problems in order to hopefully uh, give as many tips as possible about about how to get good at tactics um, and about how to uh, succeed at solving problems. So in this video, I'm going to solve uh, the next 15 problems in my survival run. Uh, the reason I won't do 25 again is because the problems will be significantly tougher um, now that we've solved the first 25, so I'm gonna spend longer explaining each problem. The other thing I will point out before I proceed is that um, I will be explaining some variations, so there's going to be some lines to calculate, and of course I can't move the pieces on the board without actually, you know, executing the solution. So, you know, if you're very serious about improvement, one thing that you can do, if you have a board lying around, you know, roll that board out, and if, if, if there's a problem which features particularly long lines, set that position up on your board and reproduce the moves that I'm saying, that'll help you follow things. If you feel confident, uh, about your ability to follow lines in your head, then, you know, by all means, that would be a great way to practice your visualization. So, without further ado, let's proceed. Uh, we see that problem number 26 is approximately 1400 rated level, although I would take these rating designations with a grain of salt. You could have a, a 700 rated problem that's very hard and, you know, 2000 rated problem that's very easy. So, these are not always very accurate. Now, here we see that the queen is hanging, but but so is the bishop. So we see that there's two attackers on the bishop and only one defender, but there's one wrinkle. If we take the bishop with a knight and he takes back, it's very important not to have what I call tunnel vision, which is a fixation on, on you know one particular thing in a position. If we take twice, um, you might notice that the, the, you know, the rook on c2 then is actually going to be hanging at the end of that variation. So what we have to do is we have to first take here, then we have to take the rook first, um, something that's called an intermediate move in order to make sure that the rook is not hanging. And after he takes the rook, now the knight is free for the taking. Simple problem, but nice little wrinkle in there. Now here we see that it's an end game. I immediately notice the black's pawns are very close to promotion. So, you know, if white doesn't do something immediately such as checkmate, he's going to lose the game, which actually limits our search and that, that helps a lot. Now we see that there's a, a rook, king, and knight, and all of them are at very close quarters with black's king. The first move that I see is to capture the pawn with check. Now that is not mate. The king can actually travel to a5. And in these situations, when you're trying to hunt for a king and deliver checkmate, all that you really have to do is make sure that you're considering every single check. So, you know, assuming that I capture on b7, and I'm going to make that move because, well, I see that it is the correct one in order to aid our visualization. There's two checks in this position. We can give a check on a7. We can actually make a draw that way. The king goes back to b6, we can go back to b7. But we don't want to rush to assume that that's the best we can do. We also have knight b3 check. And after knight b3 check, the king has to go out to a4. And then we actually deliver checkmate on a7, using this king on c4 uh, to block away all of black's potential retreat square. So check and checkmate. Pretty simple. Okay. Next position, material count indicates that white is actually down a rook and a piece. And it's the same logic as last game. When you've sacrificed a lot of material, you have to adopt this all or nothing mentality where essentially either you deliver checkmate or you lose the game. So that rules out a lot of moves that I otherwise would have considered that might be a little bit slow. I also see that black has a very nasty threat of giving a check on a1 and simplifying the position by trading rooks, uh, which is obviously not what white wants. So we essentially have to deliver a check. The first check that comes to mind is this queen check on g6. Now the king has two retreat squares. If he goes to f8, then white has checkmate by taking the pawn on h6. Notice that both the queen and the bishop are, are diagonally stopping the king from accessing any escape squares. 
If he goes to h8, then I basically have the same idea. I can give a check on e5 with a bishop. That is not the end of the story. Black can actually block that check on f6, but I think that's a good start. So let's start with that. And now let's try to understand what happens. So there's two, defend two attackers on the f6 square, and there's only one defender. And when we're attacking, one thing we want to always do is essentially clear away any defenders. When the king is all alone, it's a lot easier to checkmate than when there's you know an entire defensive entourage surrounding the king. So we're going to take both of those pieces, and that was actually a crushing attack. You're welcome to go back and actually see how that would have transpired, but white had checkmate in several different ways there. Now, this is a very nice problem because there's a lot going on here. The first thing that's going on, as I explained in the last video, one of the, the things you want to start with when you're looking at a position, apart from counting material, which is equal here, is identifying any uh, loose pieces. And by loose, I mean a piece that is not defended by any other pieces. I see here that the queen on d8 is loose or undefended. And not only is the queen undefended, there's an x-ray situation going on where black's queen is staring at, at white's queen through the rook on f6. That is a huge tactical asset because if we move the rook with check, that's called discover check, we're going to win the queen. Unfortunately, a quick look at the position reveals that we cannot move the rook away with check, but that doesn't mean we, we need to abandon the idea. Um, the fact of the matter is white's king is also very vulnerable. We see that we have a bishop on a8 that's slicing into the king position. So the move that we still need to consider is actually rook takes f2. Now, of course, because it's not a check, white is going to take black's queen. But if you look very carefully at what's available to black there, he can give a check on g2. And because the king is confined to the corner, he's got to go king h1. And that puts him right in the path of another discovered check. And what we can do with that check is capture the pawn on g3. This is one of those situations where if you have a board lying around, you're welcome to make these moves on the board uh, to help your visualization. And we actually win back white's queen, but we do so with interest. We win two pawns while we're at it. And white will have to put a piece on the long diagonal, which will then be also captured after we capture white's queen. So we take, we give a check, and problem ends there. Okay. Next problem. Well, it's very clear what the problem is. We're under a fork. So the knight is forking our queen and rook. If we allow one of those pieces to be captured, we're going to be in trouble. The other thing that white is threatening is actually checkmate. So white has two of these big threats, and it seems entirely outside of the realm of possibility that we can defend against both. But that's, you know, the beauty of Puzzle Rush. We really, you know, our eyes are often open to, to the resourcefulness available to us in many positions. And here I see that one thing that you can do when you're under a fork is move one of the pieces and simultaneously attack one of your opponent's pieces. So the first thing that I'm actually noticing is a move like queen to d5, making contact with white's queen. But not only does that not actually stop white from taking the rook because he's simultaneously going to be defending the queen, he also can give us checkmate on e8. Now we look at the rook and we see that if we move the rook away, we can move it to e3. And that achieves two aims. First of all, it stops checkmate because that rook actually guards the square. Second of all, it counterattacks white's, white's queen. So if white takes our queen, we take his, and we're actually up three pawns. So that is the way to deal with this fork. He takes the queen, we take his queen, we're up three pawns. So here I see immediately that, that both kings are in grave danger. Probably means the correct move is a check. There is only one check available to us, so we can safely make this move, even though I don't see the entire line yet. Now... When we're attacking the king in an open board and the king is running around, we want to involve as many pieces as possible into the attack. And that would mean involving the rook with rook d8 check. And here we just need to look very carefully for checkmates. A lot of people, you know, they assume that every single move leads to checkmate in a position like this, but that's actually not true. And one piece of advice is that when the king is in an open board like this and it's running around, you want to actually be super precise in terms of evaluating whether each check is actually checkmate. And if we look at this position carefully, we see that the king is cut off from the d-file. And so therefore, we can give a check on a4. And that is checkmate because the king has no escape squares. Okay. Now here, I immediately see that the queen on a6 is almost out of squares. Its only avenue of escape is actually to go back down the a-file. So a move that comes to mind quickly is rook to a7. Now, it appears that that move doesn't work because of queen takes b6. And the rook also defends that pawn. But... You know, one other very important thing, especially when you're solving tactics and you see a promising move, is not to abandon it too soon. A lot of people, they see a promising move, they see a response to it and they say, ah, you know, close, but it doesn't work. If we extend that calculation one move further, 
we see that the rook on b3 is actually undefended. So what we can do is actually shift this rook over to b7. Now, yes, we do give up the bishop, but in return, we not only take white's rook, giving us an extra exchange, but this bishop on b2 is also going to be lost because if the bishop moves to the first rank, the rook is going to move to the first rank and either skewer or fork or pick, or, 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 uh, pick off the bishop. So we win either the, the rook or the queen. Okay, he gives up the queen, so we're going to take that. Now here we're actually down a rook, which means we're either checkmating black or, or we're going to lose. I mean, there, there is absolutely zero middle ground here. Now we do have a couple of attacking tools available at our disposal. We have a rook on the seventh rank, which means that we can actually threaten checkmate on g7. And the first move that comes to mind is queen to d7. It might seem like black has no defense, but in fact he does. He can shift his queen over to b2. Notice that the queen is a very long range piece. It can defend from very long distance, defending pawn on g7. However, this is another one of those cases where it's very important not to abandon a line prematurely. And if we extend our calculation a little bit further, we can see that the rook on c7, not only does it attack g7, it can also um, sponsor the pawn essentially in playing c3 and cut off the queen. So we go c3, and in order to defend against mate, black must give up an entire queen, giving white a winning position. Okay, now here we have very sharp position, sharp middle game, which immediately tells me start looking for undefended pieces. When we have so many pieces in the center like this, king is exposed, start looking for undefended pieces, maybe we'll spot a fork. What are the undefended pieces? Well, there's two of them, rook and bishop. If we think of it that way, can we attack both at the same time? We absolutely can. Queen to f3 picks off one of the two pieces, and the problem is solved. So notice how powerful it is to always look for the undefended pieces um, in virtually any position, uh, but especially in positions where there's a lot of pieces left on the board. Now, this is weird because, you know, the first thing I see is why can't we just take the rook? There's always a catch. And I think that the catch might be knight c4 pin a, uh, forking our rook to our queen. But remember what I said about forks. Forks are not insurmountable. Oftentimes you can move one of the forked pieces either with check or by simultaneously attacking one of your opponent's pieces. Here, because the king is weak, we actually can get out of the fork Okay, by going with me. Now, he has another move, queen to a3. That seems dangerous as well. That's something I didn't anticipate. He's threatening back rank mate in addition to threatening the rook. So, first question we ask ourselves, can we move the rook and simultaneously defend against the back rank mate? And the answer is yes, we can just move the rook to the back rank and we're up in exchange. Okay, next problem. So, we have two pieces hanging. We have a queen hanging. And we have our bishop hanging. So it's, it's pretty clear that we're probably going to lose one of the pieces. We're also down a piece. So it seems that attacking is the only option available to white. Is there a way to start the attack? Well, there's only one. We have to take the pawn. Now we need to start thinking because there's two checks. Uh, well, there's technically three checks, but g6 is just dumb. If we give a check on h6, he just escapes with king g8. So that tells me we should probably at least take the pawn and put the king in a little bit of a greater danger. Now, we can make a draw with queen f6, but generally in puzzle rush, there are problems where you have to make a draw, but they usually occur a lot later. So that can be a bit of a hint. And another thing to remember is that a lot of people forget that pawns are actually very much legitimate attackers. They, they think that only a piece is capable of delivering checkmate. Well, that ain't true. And if we actually appraise the strength of white's pawns, we will see that g6 poses insurmountable threats against black's lone king so he gives us a spite check we just take and the game is over again another situation where the king is in an open board it looks like the king is checkmated but we actually need to be very careful here it may appear that g3 is actually checkmate but it is not because that allows the king to take on h3 and if we then give a check on h1 the king is just going to run to g4 so that doesn't quite do the trick but oftentimes in these cases we have to diagnose why it is that a certain move doesn't give checkmate and here the reason g3 isn't mate is because it leaves the h3 square undefended. So first thought that comes to mind, what if we actually try to defend the h3 pawn with king h2? And we don't care about anything else that's going on. We're threatening g3. So it doesn't matter that we're down a queen. We simply go g3 and we checkmate black. So let's do three more problems before we pause for this video. And a sharp position it is. We see that the king is under grave attack here. We also see that black is up in exchange, a rook for a bishop. So first thing I think about is can black actually hunt for more material with queen b1? And one of the good things I notice here is that if the king moves and I take the bishop, 
Um, you have to kind of understand how the position changes as a consequence of, you know, the last couple of moves. And here I see that by taking the bishop, we have opened up the g7 square for our king, uh, which means that if white gives a check on h4, we can just drop the king back to g7, and the king will be relatively safe from immediate attack. Let's do it. And that's correct. Okay, a lot going on here, but very important not to be scared of these problems where there's a lot going on, because generally they can be actually the easier types of problems. And when there are a lot of pieces hanging, you can't forget about, you know, the important things such as evaluating king safety. And that's exactly what I'm going to do here. I'm going to ignore for a second that everything is hanging and I'm going to look at white's king. There is a big storm cloud around white's king because we've got a rook and a knight in the attack. So even though there's chaos, we can still try to finish the attack off here. And uh, one thing I'll notice is that if we do take white's rook then white just takes our rook with check. That's certainly not what we want. Now, if we take his rook, then he's going to take our queen. That's the idea. But let's extend that line for a second using the fact that the king is weak. If we take his rook, and, and first of all, if he takes our rook back, then we just take his rook. So he's got to take our queen. And notice that the rooks can combine and deliver a devastating check on f2. Then we have two rooks and a knight in the attack, and we can actually deliver uh, a very simple back rank checkmate it's technically not going to be checkmate. White can give up a ton of pieces to stop it, but that actually doesn't matter. I mean, we're going to be up a knight in the end game, so we're going to give a check on e1, and now we're going to take the knight with our rook, and the game is going to be over. Last problem. Now, this one, it's sort of an end game, but we still see that the black's king is actually very exposed. So that tells me we need to start looking for checks. You know, sometimes people overthink these things. And, okay, well, what move should I start with? Just start with a move, and that will actually give you a lot of insights about the position. So let's start with rook f5 check. If the king goes to the sixth rank, we use the other rook to skewer the queen. If the king goes to the seventh rank, noticing all of our attackers, we can give another check on d5 with a knight, and that just seems to be devastating. At the very least, we're going to win the bishop later. That's probably good enough. So after rook f5, the king has to go to the eighth rank, but then I see... We can give him another check on the 8th rank, draw him back to the 7th rank, and we can use the latter concept to force the king onto the 6th rank. Well, we know what happens when the king gets to the 6th rank. Even if we have to give up one of our rooks, we are going to win his queen, and at worst, we're going to be up a rook in an endgame, which is obviously good enough. So there's one more thing I just noticed. If after the check, black blocks with a bishop, then he pins himself, and because he doesn't have any pawns to support the bishop with... You know, we can just win the bishop pretty easily by playing rook to f2, doubling rooks, or by playing knight to d5. Now, knight to d5, it seems to me, is inaccurate because that drops the pawn with check. So we're just going to go rook f2. And notice that after we take the bishop, if he takes and we take, at the end of the day, we're going to be up an entire knight. That end game is actually not going to be that easy to win, but it is still going to be winning. So here we have it, 40 problems down. As you can see, these are some pretty high-rated problems, but there's nothing you know, terribly difficult about them. Um, you know, the problems start getting really, really difficult when you get to the 50s. Some of these are very, very tricky. Even I get some of them wrong in the 30s and 40s. Um, but hopefully, I've, you know, as I said in the previous video, I hope this helps uh, the viewers sort of, you know, con conceptualize how, you know, good players solve problems. And as you can see, it's, it's a lot of it, it really is pattern recognition. But a lot of it are, are mechanisms and, and, and steps that everybody could take when you look at a position and i hope that i've imparted at least some of that to you and hopefully you've enjoyed the video as well uh, in the next video that will come out tomorrow we will solve the next 15 problems and well now things get really exciting because we're in the 40s and at some point i myself am actually going to fail at some of these problems but that moment hasn't arrived yet so stay tuned for the next video i hope you've enjoyed this one um, and as usual uh, i would be honored if you subscribed uh, for more uh, instructive content and uh, feel free to comment, uh, constructive criticize in the comments below. And I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Thank you very much.